I, as Bob's already kindly pointed out, the real reason I'm here is because I'm Bob's friend rather than <laughs> have any particular expertise in these issues. But um, John Lilburn, I'm interested in as a kind of transitional figure in English political culture, both in its intellectual culture, which is something I'll talk about tonight, but also in its popular culture about how people acquire the public profile. And much of my study about Lilburn is how he excited uh, popular support for his various political positions. And the arguments I'm engaged in really see the English Revolution as ushering in a new phase in British politics where we argue we're, we're having many of the same arguments still and we're having them by the same means. So for, for me, Lilburn offers a way into that moment of transition. And what I'm going to try and tell you tonight, and it's appropriate, in fact, that it's light for my talk, because I'm going to try to persuade you that there's a transition here from a world of Reformation politics, where the purification of the Christian community is a political obligation. Uh, people's individual faith impels them to purify uh, the whole of society and its political institutions, so that politics is driven by rival views of a purified religious practice and purified religious belief. That world of Ref Reformation politics gave rise to lots of complexity and, and, and problematic political issues which were not resolved. They're seen as uh, uh, causes of the English Civil War, but the exit from the English Civil War was a political settlement defined largely in terms of secular civil rights a kind of world of enlightenment politics, where the key question in politics is not religious reformation, but the rights and duties of the citizen, the obligations we have as members of a political community in a secular sense. So the argument I'm trying to sell you, using the Lilburn example, is that we exit a world where the arguments are about uh, purification of society, church and political institutions, driven by a religious vision, and we're entering a world where politics is about the protection of the rights and uh, uh, enforcement of the duties of individual citizens. And Lilburn is interesting in that respect, I think. Um, Lilburn, I'm going to, t here's the plan of attack. So this is just old legs, university teaching practice. If you feel your blood pressure falling, you can always refer to this roadmap. If we've got as far as separatism in the two states, you can be comfortable that there's not much longer to go. If you're in that state, at secular martyrdom, it might be worth tipping a wink to someone in authority to get the ambulance now. So I'm going to give you a brief account of Lilburn's life, but essentially I'm going to suggest that he modelled his political appeal on the life of a Christian martyr. He modelled his sufferings as driven by and endured on the basis of his religious faith. But what he was a martyr to was not a vision of purified religious practice or the true religion, but the civil rights of a freeborn Englishman. And in fact, that term, freeborn Englishman, is closely associated with Lilburn. He has some uh, uh, claims to be the inventor of that term, and he was known from very early in life as freeborn John. So I'm going to take you through his life and sufferings to this view of secular martyrdom talking about his religious inspiration, but then talk about two moves he made in Reformation argument which make it easier to exit into the world of Enlightenment politics. And it's at that point, I think, we can see that we're beginning to see arguments familiar to us, problems familiar to us, paradoxes which we haven't resolved, which they were already uh, aware of at that time. So <coughs> here's John in heroic mode on the left in his trial in 1649, where he was acquitted by a jury that found that he was not guilty of any crime worthy of death. And this is the heroic John Lilburn with a medal struck in his honour. Those medals still survive with the names of the jury of life and death on the back and a picture of John on the front. So this heroic Lilburn. Lilburn spent much of his life in prison or exile and a significant portion of the rest in the army doing life-threatening service on a number of occasions. He was on trial for his life three times and had to answer at the bar of the House of Lords for potentially treasonous words on another occasion too. He has the unusual distinction, in fact, of having been tried for treason under both Charles I and Oliver Cromwell. Uh, and my calculation is that in the final 20 years of his life, he spent 12 and a half in prison. Uh, 
He also had 10 children. We can talk about that in questions, perhaps. Through honourable service in the parliamentary cause and his sufferings at the hands of various authorities, the bishops, the lords, the commons, Oliver Cromwell's Council of State, he dramatised the fight of an English, individual Englishman to protect his inalienable rights from encroachment by tyrannous powers. His bravery with sword in hand and in the face of unjust prosecutions validated his political claims. That was the basis of his political career. In the course of this political life, he won some notable legal battles which have been seen as important precedents in the rights tradition. The right to refuse to plead where that might be self-incriminating. Lil Burns being been cited in the US Supreme Court. The interpretation of what it means to have a right to trial by one's peers. Uh, Lilburn was cited in the Mango 9 trial in the 1970s. And the importance of juries as a bulwark against judicial or executive tyranny. His arguments about the powers of juries dominated legal argument through to the late 18th century. Lilburn's sufferings, couched as they were in terms that made them the concern of every man, held very broad significance for many of his contemporaries and for many of those who came after him. He was a very significant public figure, worthy of a show trial, although he had no landed estate, no established profession, and no public office. His public, his public performance gave him that kind of leverage in contemporary politics. Now, he achieved much of this, which sounds very secular and rights-based, through the language and theatre of Christian martyrdom. He drew self-consciously on the martyrological tradition in giving meaning to his sufferings, but was highly unusual, I argue, in defining his cause in terms of the secular legal rights rather than of the true religion. He was unflinchingly courageous and casual of his personal safety. In more or less each of his troubles, he could have avoided quite the depth of danger into which he descended, but in each case, he pressed for confrontation over the fundamental principles he claimed to discern in the dispute. He drew strength from his faith, but unlike many of his contemporaries, he did not use his faith to develop a blueprint for public life. That came instead from the English common law, a tradition and rights which he thought all freeborn Englishmen were entitled to by virtue of being alive. So, I'll start with just one example of his sufferings. There are many. Uh, but in 1638, the first one, accused of importing dangerous books about um, the evils of bishops, pardon me, he refused to plead the High Star Chamber Oath and was sentenced for his contempt to be whipped at the cart's tail from the fleet to the old palace yard, there to be set in the pillory for two hours before being fined £500 and returned to prison, pending his conformity to the authority of the court. En route, he received more than 500 lashes with knotted cords. Um, yet in the execution thereof, he uttered many bold speeches against the tyranny of the bishops and continued to do so after his head was in the hole in the pillory. When, his hands being free, he tossed several copies of the pamphlets, the very ones he was accused of importing, he tossed them among the people, using it as an occasion to publicise these works. And Star Chamber, he'd been whipped and pilloried outside the window of Star Chamber, um, then um, sitting, heard all this and ordered him to be gagged, which was what you do to animals. It was a humiliation as much as a way of stopping him speaking. So in the pillory with his head and hands tied and his mouth um, gagged so hard, witnesses said that his jaw bled. Um, uh, he stamped his feet as the only mark of contempt for his persecutors that was open to him to make. Following this, the Privy Council ordered that in future everyone should be searched before they go into the pillory so that no one could imitate um, Lilburn. So, so thoroughly had he undermined the choreography of punishment that the directors had to change that choreography for the future. He stayed in prison, refusing to admit the authority of this unjust prosecution for two years until he was freed by Parliament. He never submitted to the authority of the court. So that's the strength of the man that we're talking about. The witnesses said that uh, his shoulders had swollen to the size of penny loaves from the beating on the way to uh, the pillory and so forth. So there's no doubt about his bravery during this ordeal. And his presentation of himself, particularly in his later printed accounts, was clearly shaped by the martyrological tradition. The point of his obduracy was to demonstrate the futility of these procedures and punishments in the face of constancy to the justice of his cause. He chose as the epigram for a pamphlet asserting his credentials as a martyr, Job 5.15. He saveth the poor from the sword, from the mouth, and from the hand of the mighty. In uh, a work of the beast, 
uh, uh, his whipping through the city and his various encounters along the way is narrated in a way that recalls Christ's journey to Calgary. And from the pillory, he celebrated the day of his wedding with Christ. When he was tied to the cart's tail, he said, welcome be the cross of Christ. In the poor man's cry, he cited Jeremiah and gave a very scriptural self-description as an heir to the kingdom and crown of glory. And in his just defense, he made explicit reference to the martyrological tradition and his place within it. Although he said he could not stand comparison with the apostles or later major figures of Christian suffering, nonetheless quotes, as I have the assurance of God in my own conscience that in the day of the Lord I shall be found to have been faithful, a time will come when those that now are apt to censure me of rashness and turbulence of spirit will dearly repent they ever admitted such a thought. Just to reinforce the point, others used his experience to encourage people who also felt at odds with Charles I's religious policies. Lilburn's example served for William Kiffin, who became later uh, one of the early Baptists. Lilburn's example served to the comfort and encouragement of all the saints, who from the consideration of the sweet supporting power of God appearing to others in their bonds, are the more encouraged publicly to hold forth their profession of the truths of the Lord Jesus with much more boldness and confidence as knowing that that God which had appeared to others of the saints in times of sufferings, even before their eyes, will also appear to them in the like condition. Lilburn's sufferings, it's a word that recurs throughout his writings, were a testament to what he referred to as his honesty and by extension to the virtue of his cause and therefore served an example for the weak against the mighty. The real pain inflicted on Lilburn was as nothing compared to the strength lent him by the rightness of his cause, his capacity to endure it, indeed his almost complete silence on the experience of pain, attracted admiration and rendered the regime powerless against him. Now, of course, many suffered in this way in early modern Europe, but for divergent causes, some of them directly contrary. Catholic and Protestant, Lutheran and Anabaptist, they could not all be martyrs, even though they had all suffered. So who were the real martyrs? Debate about that issue concentrated on the justness of the cause, not the depth of the suffering. As Nicholas Harpsfield, the Elizabethan Catholic, said in response to John Fox, the father of the Anglican martyrological tradition, we oppose Fox not with the number of martyrs, but rather with their weight, not with their deaths, but with the causes of their deaths. Fox and Harpsfield agreed that what constituted the true martyr was the willingness to die for true doctrine and zeal in imitating Christ's passion as closely as possible, but they differed fundamentally about which people had in fact died for the true doctrine. The key to Lilburn's political success, therefore, was not to suffer, but to win this battle about the meaning of his sufferings. To evoke from a majority of people empathy rather than exasperation or hostility. The aim was to elicit indignation, sympathy and anger, collective emotions which can be highly productive of political change, as we know from many historical examples. One obvious response to Lilburn's self-presentation, therefore, was to undercut it. And a key way of doing that is represented here in this mock epitaph. It was to claim that Lilburn, uh, Lilburn was claiming a sanctity for which he could have no sure warrant. As Prynne put it in 1645, Lilburn vaingloriously relates his own sufferings and deserts. Prynne was a man who'd had his ears cropped twice by the regime, so he had some authority in challenging Lilburn's credentials. Another common and more hostile response was to question Lilburn's claim to honesty by characterising him simply as, uh, we're in a cathedral, a pain in the backside. This carried a, a particular charge uh, and was particularly destructive given his claim that legal right was the cause for which he was suffering. Calling him a turbulent spirit uh, aligned him with difficult neighbours rather than with the freeborn Englishman. So following his acquittal in a trial, the final trial for his life in 1653, he was sent back to jail, this time to Jersey. There, his reputation followed him, and one of his last, perhaps even his last directly political pamphlet, was a lengthy refutation of exactly this charge of turbulency. Those who wanted him dead, he said, have filled almost every man's mouth with clamours against me, that I have ever been and continue a man of turbulent spirit, always opposing, striving and flying in the faces of all authorities, restless and never satisfied, whoever is uppermost.' 
According to these people, England would never be at peace until Lilburn was dead. And so this charge of turbulency, though he said was slight and just, nonetheless, quotes, threatens my life more than any matter that is against me. Twice his life depended on juries taking his side against the government, and twice he got away with his life. Lilburn's conviction certainly did make him a difficult man, and he did not keep all his friends. He could not, quotes, for love or displeasure, forsake or renounce the least truth that God had made known to him. In this, he was no respecter of persons either, never bearing with that in one sort of men which I condemned in others. His certainty about his own beliefs made him an unreliable ally in the sense that he was loyal to his beliefs, not those with whom, with whom he was working to promote them. Throughout his political life, he was willing to abandon alliances and friendships if he found evidence of weakness and backsliding in his collaborators. collaborators. We all know someone like this, don't we? Although he admitted to a temper at one point, he gave equal blame to those who provoked him. I may be of an hasty and choleric temper and not willing to bear their affronts. Peradventure, they may be as willing to put them upon me as I am unwilling to bear them. And lots of comment to that effect. On his own account, therefore, Lilburn's constant struggling and the trail of broken friendships he left in his wake reflected his integrity in the face of injustice, both large and small. Despite such protestations, however, the charge of turbulence persisted. In late May 1654, a satirical last will and testament was published, playing both on his anticipated death and his reputation for troublemaking. In it, Lilburn bequeathed his body to the earth, stipulating that it be embalmed and wrapped in a double sheet of lead and laid somewhere where no worm could eat it, lest it cause mutiny in the creatures or earthquakes. It never being quiet in life, it may now rest in death, and all creatures receive no prejudice by it. The final bequest was, my good counsel to all men to be careful and rest content in their callings, without meddling or intermeddling with that which belongs not to them, or is too high for them, or beyond their proper sphere or element, to shun popularity or vain applause of men, to have, covetous, to, to have covetousness and fraud, and to envy none that are in authority, but to live peaceably and quietly with all men. It concluded with a variation on a theme in a proposed epitaphs. This is just my current favourite. There are many other examples. But this also makes another case I've, I've made in academic circles that this is a great period of literary creativity. And here, uh, I think you'll agree, is a fine example. Here lies a man, no woman can deny it, which died in peace but never lived in quiet. Here's a man so skilled in law and reason he could convert the sense of the law of treason. The people pray, if o'er his grave ye walk, for to tread so softly. If he wake, he'll talk. <laughs> so, on the whole, Lilburn won this battle. He was twice acquitted by juries in very public trials in which his legal case was weak. In the 1653 trial, trial, in fact, the, the government needed to prove that he was John Lilburn and that he was in the country, <laughs> which was quite easy to do since he'd sworn to being John Lilburn and was there before him their very eyes. But his persuasiveness about his suffering and the cause of his suffering uh, uh, swayed the juries and twice he was acquitted when he, really he didn't have a legal case uh, to his name. Those trials in 1649 and 1653 were associated with strong public feelings. In both cases provision was made for the security of the court and his acquittal greeted with public celebrations. In these life or death situations it was crucial that his suffering elicited sympathy and that depended on successful identification with his sufferings. This was the political charge carried by his perennial claim that his was the cause of all freeborn Englishmen. So secular martyrdom. The potential to mobilise support through an emotional identification was inherent in the model of martyrdom uh, that had evolved in Reformation England. It was open to the weak and powerless, turning, that, turning weakness into an asset uh, by deploying the model of Christ. As one historian puts it, an individual willing to suffer the consequences and able to present his or her sufferings in a way that conforms to the model of Christ could galvanise resistance and destabilise the most authoritarian regime. Lilburn's peculiarity, as I've already said, was to invite this emotional identification with a secular legal inheritance rather than a vision of the true religion. An extremely unusual element of Lilburn's appeal to the ideal of the martyr was that it was made to Englishmen, not to co-religionists. 
He did not suffer for his religious conscience, except insofar as it demanded that he resist tyranny. Of course, Lilburn's first prosecution derived from his religious opposition to the regime and his sense of suffering for the truth of that cause sustained him through his punishment and imprisonment. Those who were invited to take comfort from his suffering were those who also felt persecuted by Charles I's church. But his prosecution was actually for contempt of court, not for the content of his religious beliefs. He never answered the charges that he was importing dissident books, insisting that to demand an answer under oath infringe the rights guaranteed by Magna Carta and the Petition of Right. From this point of departure, his presentation of his public cause became steadily more secular. He himself distinguished four phases in his careers down to 1649, his opposition to the bishops, to the lords, to the lords and commons together, and finally to Cromwell's Council of State. During the 1650s, he presented himself as a defender of the Commonwealth, defined as the legal rights guaranteed to every freeborn Englishman. The language in which he campaigned, however, retained strong links with the traditions of Protestant opposition. Uh, this first one is, from, uh, is the opening of Innocency and Truth Justified and has a standard martyrological turn. Dear and well-beloved brethren, it was the lot and portion of our only Lord and Master Jesus Christ to be persecuted, reviled, reproached, and counted a troubler of the world, and not fit to breathe therein. All true, but being those things doesn't make you Jesus, was the counter case. Anyway, um, and this even by his own countrymen and friends. And if we, his servants, meet with the same measure, he hath commanded us not to be dismayed or troubled. And the reason is because the servant is not above the master. And with all that we might go on cheerfully in bearing the yoke of our master, he hath engaged himself to bear part of it with us and takes all that is done to us for adhering to him as done unto himself. Standard martyrological stuff. But the rest of this pamphlet is an account of secular injustice he suffered despite his sterling, sterling service to the parliamentary cause. And frankly, it's a little bit unedifying. It's about debts to him owed by the government for military service or lost military possessions or factional battles about getting access to the spoils of war. Lilburn invested heavily in, in um, seized royalist lands. So there's a juxtaposition between the secular injustice he's identifying and this Christian language. For Lilburn, the experience of the Civil War included a kind of animal farm moment when he saw the pigs, having taken over, begin to walk on two legs. The real conflict he came to see was not between king and parliament, but between the people and tyranny. He became famous as one of the leveller leaders, trying to recover the people's lost liberties by establishing a government based upon an agreement of the people. He would have accepted a monarchical settlement, in fact, uh, if it had embraced these principles and rejected the Crom Cromwellian regime because it did not. It was increasingly clear to him then that the cause for which he suffered was, quotes, the laws, liberties and rights of all the people of this land and uh, that is the only principle that now carries me on in opposition in this case to the Lords in 1646. Writing later, he could see that it was for this reason that he'd taken on the bishops and he'd stood for the same principle since, quotes, in the midst of many deaths. This he did not only in obedience to God, but, quotes, out of duty to myself and my neighbours. This was a civic duty owed to his fellow countrymen and pursued in obedience to God. As the title of the Resolved Man's Resolution puts it, he was committed, quotes, well, I won't read it, it's too long. Um, uh, Lilburn then became a martyr, not for a version of the faith, but for the rights of all the people of this land. Martyrs, in a sense, create communities, forming a focus of shared emotional commitment and empathetic engagement. The community that Lilburn was summoning was not people with the same religious commitment as him, but all the people who shared the same rights. As he said, Parliament hath taken care that the Bible shall be in English, so that laymen, as so, so they call them, may read it as well as the clergy, Ought they not also to be as careful that all the binding laws of England be in English likewise, so that every free man may read it as well as the lawyers? What Englishmen shared with him was an interest in the due execution of English law, a recognition of the rights that an Englishman enjoyed by virtue of being born. Lilburn and his supporters wanted their audience to understand that if tyranny was not opposed, then Lilburn's sufferings could be experienced by anyone, 
or everyone else. As Richard Overton, another level of leader, put it in 1646, since Lilburn's case is mine and every man's, though we be at liberty today, we may be in New Newgate tomorrow, if the House of Lords so please. He was defending something that belonged to all his countrymen, in other words. No, nope, still haven't got there. The law of England is the birthright and inheritance of the people of England, yea, of the meanest as well as of the richest. And it's that legal equality before the law that earned them the title of levellers. Lilburn's manipulation of the martyrological tradition for this distinctive purpose was at least partly self-conscious. He was, in fact, explicit in making a very dubious move in his use of the Christian martyrological tradition. He claimed that the history showed that in every age since Christ, some of the most faithful servants of Christ had suffered, quotes, sometimes upon a religious and sometimes upon a civil account, and very often both in one and the same person. This is quite a sleight of hand, I think. Not that martyrs fell foul of civil authorities as a result of their religious beliefs, but that martyrdom sometimes receded from the civil account alone. I'll read that phrase again. Sometimes upon a religious and sometimes upon a civil account, and very often both in one. But he claims that some of these people are martyrs for the civil laws, not for their religious conscience. And this allowed him to claim, rather improbably, that Huss, Wycliffe, the Marian martyrs, and the Huguenots, for example, were defending not rival versions of the true religion, but the civil constitution of the society in which they lived. So, as we've seen, the con for contemporaries, it was the cause, not the suffering, that distinguished the true martyr. Lilburn did not submit himself to a doctrinal or theological test. He doesn't describe his religious beliefs between 1638, in his very early pamphlets, and at the very end, uh, uh, when he quote, uh, converted to Quakerism. In between, he's silent about his own religious convictions. <coughs> God's work through Lilburn was to defend the civil constitution of his national community and its specific legal guarantees. And the beneficiaries to be, were to be all Englishmen, many of whose religious beliefs Lilburn knew to be fundamentally mistaken. By stages, his cause became a set of claims about law and rights, things common to Englishmen. It entailed no detailed claim about the nature of the true religion. As he said in 1653, there being not one particular I have contended for, or for which I have suffered, but the right, freedom, safety, and well-being of every particular man, woman, and child in England. The collective response at which he aimed then was an emotional commitment to this civic uh, inheritance, not to his confessional identity. This distinguished him from most contemporary political martyrs. And as the subtitle of this pamphlet, England's Weeping Spectacle, puts it, his sufferings were a glass wherein all Englishmen may see the slavish condition unto which, after so much blood, time, and treasure spent, they are yet, by perfidious men, who vowed and promised to deliver them from tyranny and oppression, still most woefully subjected. The target was slavery and tyranny, not false religion, and the uh, offenders were the hypocrites in charge of uh, government. So this is not to deny his religious inspiration. I need to speed up a bit, but... There's a feeling of exhilaration in his sufferings at the moment he feels most close to God. It's clear that in this cause, his faith uh, uh, supported him. So I'm never so much an heroic and daring man, nor so much carried out with divine supportation, strength, assistant, counsel, and presence of the Lord God Almighty. That immediate experience, immediate religious experience for him, persecution as when by my wicked base, cowardly and cruel adversaries I am most dealt with in the quite contrary and thereby and by their barbarism stripped and robbed. Um, so one connection between his campaigns and his Christianity was how his faith gave him the strength to endure these sufferings and this hardship. Secondly, scriptural example was crucial for him. He cited biblical passages throughout his work to demonstrate that what he demanded under English law was also granted to him by divine law. And biblical history was a common source of examples for him too. Thirdly, he frequently presented his sufferings as a test of his faith. I have abundantly tasted the God, of God's tossing and tumbling dealings with me in this world, which to me as a mere man hath been nothing but a veil of tears, yea, a pilgrimage, full of sorrows and afflictions, 
to my earthly house of clay. And finally, of course, he made frequent reference to the errors of popery and the persecuting spirit of Presbyterianism. Nonetheless, the strength he drew from God was consistently expressed, as I've said now perhaps too many times, in defense of secular rights, not his religious conscience. It was the cause, not the suffering, that made the martyr. The suffering lent an emotional charge to the cause. Lilburn's sufferings created an emotional charge in relation to England's civic inheritance. He wanted people to feel what it meant to be a freeborn Englishman. In order to make this move then, this, to have uh, an emotion appeal suffused with the language and theatre of Christian martyrdom, but to tie that to a secular cause, not the definition of a true religious community, was a novel move. And it involved drawing on some fundamental distinctions. Firstly, between two states. Lilburn thought there were two states. This is not uh, unusual in Christian in the Christian tradition. There's a civil state governed by human laws established after the time of Christ, governed by its own laws and charters, not by biblical precept because it postdates Christ and the scriptures. The Christian uh, kingdoms are governed by their own laws, charters and liberties for their mutual good. The test, the biblical test of those things is whether they are consonant with divine law and natural law, but they're not derived from scriptures. So the civil state is its own human construction uh, governed uh, under its own laws. The ecclesiastical state uh, consisted of a true form established by Jacob and the apostles, which was governed by scripture, a primitive Christian purity form of uh, worship, which was dictated um, in the time of the apostles. But there was also, and uh, you'll forgive me for saying this out loud in a cathedral, there was a false form of religion, a false form of uh, ecclesiastical state, which had been established by Satan. Um, and it was governed by the smoky politic state of the crowned locusts or Roman clergy. And by that he meant the English bishops. They had their own canons, books, and authority by which they established uh, their, their position in this false uh, uh, ecclesiastical state. And it was established by Satan to, Satan to combat uh, the true and pure apostolic worship. Now, this uh, argument about two states enabled Lilburn to say <clears throat> that his religious conscience had nothing to do with the civil authorities. As long as he obeyed the civil authorities' laws, charters, and liberties for their mutual good, his religious conscience was beside the point. His fight was for the true form of apostolic Christianity, and that was a matter for him outside um, the jurisdiction of the civil state. So, um, Lilburn's action as a concerned citizen was a matter of Christian duty. In the 1630s, the problem was that the false church under Archbishop of Lord in order to preserve its position, had begun to corrupt the civil state. And that's why his case is, I got into trouble because my civil rights were being infringed by the false ecclesiastical state trying to establish the kingdom of Satan here in England. Perfectly reasonable argument. You can absolutely understand the archbishop and the king being very open to that line of argument about what was going on. Nonetheless... In a way, he's trying to draw the teeth of one of the deep problems in Reformation re politics. After 1517, Christianity had splintered, and that set in reality uh, a situation in which every thinking Christian was potentially at odds with the religion as practiced in their civil state. The response of many people to that Reformation problem was to enforce a form of religion within the civil state in order to contain the dangers of religious plurality. So there's a strong pressure in most Reformation states to establish religious unity. Lilburn uh, and that caused civil wars throughout Europe in the hundred years from 1517 to 1617. Civil wars on religious grounds were exacerbated by religious identities. International wars where the stakes were raised by the religious claims of either side. 
religion in that situation where it had a transcendent uh, uh, importance in determining the identity and loyalty of a, of a citizen, but where the citizens all differed in their religious beliefs, produced a highly unstable political situation. Lilburn's argument that, in fact, the civil state has its own laws, and as long as you obey the civil laws, your religious conscience is neither here nor there, in a sense, draws the teeth of all that Reformation politics. And people can look at Lilburn and agree that he is protecting their civil rights without having to ask themselves, do I believe with this man's religion? So, in a sense, it offers an exit route from where Reformation politics had got by the 1640s. But it depended on this second very important idea, and that is that a church consists only of a company of people called and separated out of the world by the word of God, joined together in fellowship of the gospel by voluntary profession of faith and obedience of Christ. Now here, is, this is a rather technical issue, at least to me, do I want to go into it or not? No, I don't. Let's just draw attention to the fact that nowhere there does he give any role to any human authority in defining what the word of God is, what fellowship of the gospel is, and how you would know whether you were in obedience to Christ. It's simply the conscience of the congregation which decides. Now this is an extremely radical position in early modern Europe. He's achieved, he's drawn the teeth of the tension between religious and civil obligations by saying there's a civil state and that's the civil state. But on the other hand, he's made the dangers of religious disorder much greater by saying any group of people who get together in fellowship of the gospel and following Christ's word is a church. And it has to be a voluntary church. So it's an invitation to religious pluralism. It's going to exacerbate the very problem that many people are most anxious about in early modern Europe. So since the 16th century, Reformation, since the 16th century Reformation, Christians had been faced with increasing religious pluralism. And to any particular Christian, some of this practice was bound to appear wrong-headed. They confronted the fact of religious error, but also the difficulty of finding grounds to define what was and was not acceptable since it was impossible truly to know God's mind. In dealing with this problem, contemporaries drew a distinction between the invisible church of all believers, which was known only to God, and the visible churches in this world, and then they tried to find criteria for establishing which visible churches were acceptable and which were not, which visible churches will the word of God be manifest in. Well, we might gloss Lilburn as solving that problem by saying there was a universal invisible church and particular churches that were not national institutions. So the, his uh, national obligations had nothing to do with his church membership. He was separated out of the church in a voluntary profession of faith and he had religious duties in relation to the civil state, which were quite separate. But this was plainly quite dangerous territory. Suppose groups came together in such voluntary professions of faith, but were in fact deeply misled. Heresy, blasphemy, and lost souls were dangers that led many contemporaries to think that there should be some form of discipline over the regulation of visible churches. Had the Reformation not started, in fact, in the attempt to free Christians from a corrupt visible church? Might not congregational independence therefore threaten true Christian practice as much as popery had? On this issue of religious independency then, Lilburn was bitterly divided from some of those who'd supported him in his early clashes with the Lordian Church. They'd wanted to reform rather than dismantle the Church of England. His was a much more radical solution to the problem of a corrupt English church. Now the end point of all this for Lilburn was Quakerism, a point he reached just over a year before his death. As he wrote to a fellow Quaker after his conversion, his intention in what remained to him of his life would be to redeem my lost and misspent, bypassed, precious time, and not now to consult with flesh and blood in my daily taking up the cross of Christ. This apparent withdrawal was regarded with suspicion by the authorities who thought he was just trying to get his money back, um, and by disapproval from his former allies who thought he should continue to struggle against tyranny. 
As he said, all my old and familiar friends, in a manner, are so much troubled and offended with me, and my great adversary is so jealous of the real intentions of my heart. Personally, though, I'm convinced of his sincerity, and certainly he left off worrying about his family in this period. Christopher Hill, the great Civil War historian, thought that many radical Christians came to this withdrawal, to a personal concern with salvation. In a way, it represented one way of dealing with the experience of defeat in trying to reshape and perfect society and the church. It amounted to a redefinition of Reformation as a personal journey towards spiritual spiritual renewal rather than a collective one. For Hill, Bunyan was the model for future generations, the pilgrim's progress being essentially an individual journey, albeit one supported and shared by others. The guide to Reformation for these later generations of radicals then was no longer Jean Calvin with his view of the imperative need for total societal reformation and the purification of the church. It was a model of personal spiritual quest and of a more intimate autobiographical concern with what it meant to be a good Christian. So Lilburn stands for one radical Christian uh, trajectory out of this crisis. For more mainstream Christians, perhaps, the issues came to focus on the importance of the individual conscience, but also how important it was that that should be tempered with humility. You will have gathered from my lecture here that Lilburn is not preeminently known for his um, humility. There's a picture. (laughs) I don't even be able to see it. Anyway, for more mainstream Christians, the key issues were conscience and humility. Cheney Culpepper, writing uh, an obscure Kentish gentleman whose letters happen to survive here in the Sheffield Library. Cheney Culpepper, writing in the mid-1640s, at a high point of controversy about societal reformation and the purification of the churches, said that conscience was, quotes, God's peculiar. It was a jurisdiction that stood within uh, uh, England, but it was not the jurisdiction of the English church. The conscience, a peculiar as a place within a diocese that belonged to another jurisdiction. He was saying that the individual conscience, God's peculiar, was a place beyond episcopal or clerical jurisdiction. The way out of these tensions between religious and political obligations then was to say that the individual conscience was outside the argument. It was a matter between you and God. Of course, the danger of a free conscience was that individuals might follow the promptings of what they thought was their conscience, but thereby lead themselves and others into sin and error, my usual example being supporting Manchester United. (laughs) A free conscience, then, had to be tempered by humility, something... Anyway, I'll leave that (laughs) argument. A free conscience, then, had to be tempered by humility about the difficulty of truly understanding God's purposes for us. This was a key charge Lilburn made against the Cromwellian regimes, in fact, that they confused their religious conscience with their political life and even their immediate self-interest. A revealing term of abuse he used for them was knippadollings, a reference to one of the key figures in the regime of the Munster Anabaptists in the early 16th century, led by John of Leiden. For many early modern Christians, these people had brought the power of godliness into disrepute by using it to justify all sorts of obvious sin, and misgovernment. In the same way, in Lilburn's view, the knippadollings of, Cromwell, of Cromwellian England had made the power of godliness, quotes, more reproachful and contemptible in the eyes of the sons of men than ever the foolish and ridiculous actions fathered on and said to be committed at Munster by John of Leiden, uh, Leiden and Knippadolling, whom in folly, murder, madness and ridiculous you have, ridiculousness you have visibly in the face of all the world outstripped. The diagnosis of what was wrong with the regime again points to a sharp separation in Lilburn's mind between personal spiritual growth and the civic duties of the Christian. The charge against those who could see the hand of God at work in the detail of secular life was really one of vanity. It's a point made clearly by the painting, but not the picture of the painting, in the York City Art Gallery, which draws an unlikely parallel between Charles I, John of Leiden, and Knipperdolling. They were men who'd brought disaster on their followers through their religious certainty and spiritual pride by confusing the administration of human law with the pursuit of godliness. Uh, the picture has... Um, uh, this is um, Charles I, this is uh, Nippodolling and John of Leiden, and here is uh, a tract about the Munster Anabaptists, and it's a vanitas piece about how 
human life is transitory um, and the vanity of worldly ambition and worldly calling and so forth. But it puts this particular purpose and this odd juxtaposition of Charles I, the Anglican martyr, with the um, Munster Anabaptists. To what, are, to what question is that the answer, Charles I and the Anabaptists? <laughs> More mainstream Christians than Lilburn then tended to temper their exploration of the individual conscience for, and God's purposes for them with readings in scripture and the traditions in the church as ways of gauging whether or not uh, the, the, what they took to be the promptings of the conscience were really the promptings of the conscience. They were willing to be guided by scripture and the tra traditions of the church and heeding clerical pastoral advice. Again though, all this was to be directed more inwardly than at the transformation of social life at large or of public institutions. And there I've got to my starting point, which is at this point we're talking about religion as a personal experience, an inward pilgrim a pilgrimage undertaken internally and personally uh, by whatever rules we might think are necessary to guide us as Christians. Our Christian conscience is not the basis for reforming society and political institutions. So, Lilburn's legacy. Many threads of thought and reflection then, I think, extend from those times to ours, and I think we can see many potential connections, many of the arguments we still have, many of the paradoxes we still um, confront in these resolutions to the problems of Reformation politics. I just want to finish with some reflection on Lilburn's own legacy, specifically for the language of martyrdom. Uh, looking across his career, it seems fair to say that Lilburn had more success in claiming the status of suffering champion than his opponents had in portraying him as a turbulent spirit. He seems to have won the public battle over whether he was suffering for a just cause, at least on the most crucial occasions. Lilburn dramatised abstract political principles in a way that clearly did, in these most important public contracts, contests, elicit a sympathetic public response. His political martyrdom, couched as it was in terms that did not call for public reformation, was more easily received in the emerging world of Enlightenment politics than were the political programs of many of his fellows, who often seemed unattractive or simply incomprehensible in their religious enthusiasm as the 18th century knew it. Lilburn's example, by contrast, was important to 18th century figures who confronted government in court. He was republished at the time of the Sacheverell <coughs> trial, by a publisher who was keen to locate more Lilburn texts. And there was a clear connection with John Wilkes, who was presented with Lilburn's pamphlet, The Christian Man's Trial, on the eve of his own trial. And Liberty Vindicated Against Slavery, for example, had been reprinted in London in 1771. He was familiar to country Whigs, people who resisted um, uh, court corruption. He was familiar to country Whigs as a champion of opposition to oligarchy. Uh, one of the jokes about him at the time was that he was England's Cato, uh, to Oliver Cromwell's Caesar. And there are clear resonances too with the political views, although not, although not the political practice, of Charles James Fox. Fox's libel act in itself an important protection against politically motivated prosecutions uh, uh, against publishers. Uh, Fox's libel act seems to owe more than a little to Lilburn's arguments in his own defence. To that extent then, we might say that he contributed to what some historians call rights talk, the everyday use of the language of rights in discussing political matters, making a theory of politics based on rights the currency of everyday discussion by people who have little formal grounding in that theory but have an emotional commitment to the ideal. You can't um, take away the staff coffee room. That's against my rights. Lilburn earned the label radical in the shadow of the French Revolution in the period in which the term required force as a political descriptor. This image of the freeborn Englishman with the padlocked lips, uh, the freeborn Englishman seems to me very reminiscent of some of the iconography about Lilburn himself. Jeremiah Joyce, awaiting trial for high treason in 1794 as part of the crackdown on radical publication debate in England, had a bound copy of Lilburn's tracts at his side. This later came into the possession of William Hone, the radical bookseller, and was a great comfort to him too in his own battle against the government's attempts to suppress dangerous publication. Hone had read an account of Lilburn's trials by chance as an 11-year-old, and the influence on him was rivaled only by the experience of reading Bunyan. When Hone was himself in court in 1817, 
um, his performance bears striking similarities to Lilburn's at his trial in 1649. And in fact, it was a transcript of the 1649 trial that had got Hone interested in Lilburn in the full, first place. So here we can see a direct line of descent into the modern radical pantheon from someone who through his sufferings became a defender of his legal birthright via the circle of London radicals, the London Corresponding Society, to William's, William Hone's battles for the freedom of the press. This, and here you'll hear my pain as someone negotiating a publishing contract, this takes us tantalisingly close to a connection between Lilburn and Gandhi, where the money really is. Gandhi, as is very well known, was very influenced by Thoreau, and Thoreau's own influences can be traced back to these early 19th century English circles through Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson travelled to England in the early 1830s and was a friend of the Romantic poets and of Thomas Carlyle, who's an important figure in scholarship on the English Revolution. Shelley's father-in-law, William Godwin, was a veteran of the radical circles of the 1790s, 1790s and also a serious scholar of the Revolution, the author of a four-volume history of the English Commonwealth. So this does take us tantalisingly close to link through those romantics to Gandhi. Unfortunately, for both Carlyle and Goodwin, Lilburn was an extremely unattractive character. Godwin gave Lilburn a lot of space but did not like him. For him, Lilburn was too literal-minded, insisting on specific rights in particular circumstances. This was the kind of thinking fit for ordinary times, but not for the definition of a new social and political order of the kind that was happening in England in the 1850s or as the Romantics thought was happening in the 19th century. So for Godwin, Lilburn was a slave of the rules of privilege and law which were adapted for ordinary times. Carlyle, elaborating on the role of the hero in directing the passions of society, took a similarly unsympathetic view of Lilburn, preferring instead Cromwell, the man who'd famously said he was not wedded and glued to forms of government and who saw constitutions come and go as he sought a just settlement of society. Carlyle consistently sought to confront the social, spiritual and political needs of European societies in the face of the collapse of what he saw as the certainties of medieval culture. In order to do this, men had to move beyond the detritus of traditional structures and practices which had littered the landscape of their beliefs. They received forms of social life, and they had to reconstruct society around authentic beliefs. An object of authentic belief would have to be an emanation and embodiment of fundamental values reflecting the current state of human understanding. Carlyle's concern then was primarily that 19th century needed new objects of this kind, but he looked to the past for other examples, and his example was Cromwell, not Lilburn. To Carlyle, Lilburn was, quotes, a contentious, disloyal, commonplace man, little distinguished, saved by his ill nature, his blindness to superior worth, and a dark internal fermentation of his own poor, angry, limited mind. The rest of that letter actually goes on to say, this is someone who'd written to him saying, do you think I should do a biography of Lil Ben? <laughs> the answer is no. So Lil Ben remains important to modern jurisprudence and the rights tradition, but later political martyrs seem to owe more to the romantic conceptions of Carlyle and Godwin than to Lil Ben, whose politics were essentially restorative and backward-looking and who seemed obsessed with the inherited legal uh, inherited and specific legal rights of the English civil state rather than a, any more inspiring view of politics in general and politics as a possibility of human perfection. In that context, he seems a pedant or barrack room lawyer rather than a visionary. Like Lilburn, Gandhi successfully confronted and shamed an unjust regime by forcing it to show its teeth. Unlike Lilburn, however, Gandhi did not take his stand on the specific legal rights that the regime was supposed to accord him. Rather, he lived out an alternative social and political ethic, demonstrating its moral superiority by undergoing unjust suffering for his civil disobedience. One way of thinking about this is through the almost total absence of the word happiness from Lilburn's writings. While many other martyrs have had their eyes on a distant prize, the promise of redemption of one kind or another, Lilburn's rhetoric was about loss and betrayal and the need to recover particular liberties or to get a particular check paid. It's a powerful case, but lacks the inspirational quality attractive to the Romantics and to their heirs. 
Lilburn then was grappling with the relationship between his deeply held personal religious convictions and his obligations as a citizen or subject. Many of his contemporaries felt driven to impose their view of the Reformed Church on all Christians and to try to force civil government to join them in that effort. That was the core of Reformation politics. Lilburn, by contrast, separated his obligations to his church, which was not a national institution, from his obligations to his civil state, which was. His Christianity imposed different obligations in these two spheres. It reduced the toxicity of religious diversity for civil order because all inhabitants of the state had the same civil rights, whatever their religious convictions. But it depended on the end of the ambition to establish a single, embracing, purified church. It turned Reformation inward and made politics a matter more of policing particular secular powers than of promoting the collective moral good. Lilburn's answers were not typical and do not persuade everyone who encounters them, but their interest, I think, lies in this. They are answers that sit better in a world of enlightenment politics and rights talk than in the world of Reformation politics from which they'd arisen. His arguments are ours in a way that many of his contemporaries are not, and that, I think, is one source of fascination in the study of the English Revolution. Thanks.